Yeah. Well, since we are getting close to Christmas, I thought I'd start preaching my Christmas messages now. And uh, just to build the atmosphere. And uh, so I'd like you, if you have your Bibles, to turn to Matthew chapter 1. And it's very funny, I'm going to read the whole few verses. This is the start of the introduction of Jesus Christ, the genealogy. Everybody say genealogy. In other words, the family tree of Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. Okay? And uh, it's going to be very interesting. I just want to try to share a little bit from here. And then next week we'll see what happens, uh, what the Lord has for us. Also, what's that humming sound? Kill it. I don't need a monitor. Kill the monitor. Somebody bring out a gun. Bang! That's how you should treat electrical stuff. Okay? Thanks, no, just kill that. Uh, as you know that, you know, we are looking forward to paying off our KL building in three years. All right? So this is our first year. We intend to uh, pay it up by, uh, in three years' time. So we will, we will share with you more about the vision of the church and what we're doing. This next couple of weeks, we'll also be talking about our missions project. Now, some of you have been in the church for a long time. You know that we are supporting our Orphanage Shepherd Center. Now we have a new ministry with the Pakistanis who are here. And every month it costs over a couple of a thousand plus dollars, I think. And a few of them are run, helping to run it. And also we've got Kuala Selengo and Kapa and all these places. So your giving is phenomenal. You people have been consistent. Some of you may have forgotten to give your faith pledge. So I want to remind you, before the year ends, and if you want to have a very good year next year, fulfill your pledge. Do not make a pledge and not fulfill it. Amen. Can I have some smiles from your face? Yeah, yeah, that's right. You all look like... Okay, I think you're still in love with that elephant. That was a big elephant, let me tell you. I just, I just enjoyed it. The Thai people are some of the best people with animals. How could... You know, I've got photos of an elephant painting. This is not, not kidding. Right in front of everybody, they mix the paint, they put the brush, the elephant dips it in there and paints. And the painting is of scenery. You can see people at the back watching and I'm standing behind the elephant and he takes up the paintbrush and paints trees, hills, the sky. Right in front of you. It's amazing. The Thai people fell in love with it. So good. So we are into our missions project um, next year again. We want to continue to support. Uh, whether we have our finances or not, friends, whether you have given or not, the church digs deep and we give because we've committed ourselves to this project. Some of you, sometimes you give, sometimes you don't give. That's your attitude. I can't help it. But we as a church are committed to give and to support those works. Are you with me? All right. So whether money comes in or not, we still give. So we dig deep. We cut back our pay sometimes so that we can fulfill other people's pay. So if you don't know about the finances of this church, and you should, talk to the financial people. Uh, they are in our leadership. You can ask them the questions. They will give you the reports of all of that. And what I want to do by end of this year is to share with you the vision for 2016. And I pray, I know a lot of people are not here today because some of them are away and, and so on and so forth. But we want to share the vision for 2016. And I want the whole church to get behind the vision. We are believing God for a new launch of a new preaching place in Shah Alam. By the middle of next year, we will be preaching in a building in Shah Alam in two years or three years time when we've got our piece of land ready and we are waiting for that. Right now, all the negotiations are going through. As you know, I've told you, we have been given this piece of land. We didn't buy it, we were given and we've got to build on it. So in three years, that's going to happen. So this church... You know, it's just going to go into a brand new uh, property and together we will just grow together. Now, listen carefully. Listen to me. You, you won't hear me say this too often. You, in fact, you very seldom see me coming to church because we've got that many preaching points. One, we are believing God to raise up more and more people just like you. I'm so glad that we've got some very good in-house preachers, worship leaders, Sunday school teachers. I thank God. So in other words, the ministry is not on Pastor Joe. I was sitting someone the other day and he says, you know, I, every time I come to church, I want to hear you speak. I like your preaching. I like your style. I can resonate with you. I really love you, Pastor, but many times you're not around. I said, get used to it. Get used to it. If you're just waiting for Pastor Joe, it ain't going to happen. I can meet you on a weekday and I can have coffee and tea with you and I can pat you on the back, hold your hand and pray for you. 
but you're not going to see me around every Sunday. You better make up your mind. If this is the place God has sent you, make up your mind and be in it, whoever the preacher might be. And last week we had a great preacher here and a great altar call. And that's our in-house preachers. All right? These are our in-house. We're not just bringing in guest speakers, big names. We're raising up people to do the work of the kingdom. Can you say amen? And then in our KL church, we had two dynamic preachers that preached there. And a great altar call. People were on the floor. Everything, everything that, you know, Pastor Joe, if I was there, it would have been the same. You can do the same thing. So one, we're going to listen carefully. We're going to be raising up people. We'll be challenging young people to step up, old people to step in, <laughs> to move on. And let's do a journey together, all right? And the uh, second thing I want you to know is that we will be believing God for great things to happen, and I want you to be behind it, all right? I want you to be behind the vision of the church. Okay, done that. My announcement is finished. I've got a few minutes to finish this message. Hallelujah. So I count it a privilege where I get the chance to preach in this church. If, I, if I'm not here, I count it a privilege. God sent me. Now, this is my home, okay? So C3, KL, Clang, and many other works that we start is our home. So our first priority and our best energy and our best finances is giving goes to the home because we know we are home. So I'm not running around here and there and preaching everywhere unless that church there is slowly beginning to connect with our church and probably looking at the possibility of becoming one of our churches. Now, we took about four years to become a C3 church because we studied the movement. We were very cautious. We moved in slowly. So other churches who know me and want to be a part of our church have a right to study us. They can get on our website. That's why this is very important. Our Facebook has to be updated. Everything has to be sharp so that people can watch us from, from a distance and check us out. They have a right to ask the questions. They have a right to check us out. Are we, are we for real? And then after maybe a few years, they might want to be a part of our church and the movement. So we're on a journey here, and I pray that you won't get tired and lazy and leave the job to other people, the same people doing the same thing, and you just sitting back and just being a, you know, just being a blob, just doing nothing. But let's do something. Let's, let's glorify God. You know, it's going to be a great year, brand new year. You know, there'll be wars and rumors of wars. Our government has passed a new law, and I know this is being recorded, uh, that, that uses the, the Security Act as something that, you know, out of, they want to control what's going on uh, in our country. But I see everything I see. I see it, well, well, God has got a good plan. God's got greater plans. Okay? God has got great plans. God's still in charge of the government of Malaysia. Whatever they might put up, whatever they might say, Jesus is still Lord of Malaysia. I believe that firmly. I preach it. I pray for it. I declare it in Jesus' name. Let's read this amazing start of this wonderful chapter, Matthew chapter 1. Now, if you were to write a genealogy, a history, if you all for that matter, if you want to start writing a book, you must write a book with a punch in it to grab the attention of the reader. Am I correct? Hello, are you with me? Yeah. You, you, when, if you direct a movie, the start of the movie and the end are the most very, very important. So Matthew writes this book and the genealogy of Jesus Christ, and this is how he writes. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Aminadab, Aminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. You notice he drops in a woman every now and then. Okay, and who are these women? Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Uh -huh. Obed, the father of Jesse. Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother was Uriah's wife. Doesn't even mention her. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Uzziah. 
Uziah, the father of Jotham, Jotham, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Ammon, Ammon, the father of Josiah, Josiah, the father of Zechariah, Zechariah, and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon, up to the exile of Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, the father of why can't they make easier names? Abihud, Abihud, the father of Eliakim, Eliakim, the father of Azor, Azor, the father of Zedek, Zedek, the father of Akim, Chinese guy, Akim, the father of Elihud, Elihud, the father of Eliezer, Eliezer, the father of Nathan, Nathan, the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, Mary, the mother of Jesus, who is the Christ. Just reading that, I deserve a big clap. Come on. Man, alive. Oh, man, give me an oxygen mask. This is how they started off with the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Now, if you just read it as a history book, you probably will fall asleep. So and so beget, so and so, very deep. Not interesting at all. Now, you must understand that in the Old Testament times or in Old Bible times, there were no TVs, there were no movies. So knowing that genealogy, where they came from and who they were, was very important. There were no computers to trace their background. So what was Matthew thinking when he wrote this book? What was he trying to tell the people? Because Israel loved their genealogy. They would sit around fireplaces. They would talk about their fathers. And because they knew the Talmud, the Old Testament, whenever a name is mentioned, they knew the story of that person very well. They will rehearse it. They will talk about it. They knew the Torah. And whenever they talked about their lineage and their parents and their family tree, they had a sense of belonging, a sense of identity. They knew who they were. They had a sense of dignity. And they passed it on to their children. So in other words, they felt, I am not an accident. I am a planned person. I am somebody. I belong to somebody. So for example, if somebody wanted to be a priest in Jesus' day, he couldn't just say, God called me, I'm going to be a priest. He had to check, they had to check his background, whether his family had any lineage all the way to Aaron in the Old Testament. So you must understand, as you read this, in Jesus' day, it was a verbal culture, an oral culture. Written documents were not that many. So if they wanted to have legal status, you say you own this property, who is your father? They had to have some kind of verification. Of course, there were legal documents, but somebody had to say, yes, yes, this boy, his father and his grandfather, and they grand grand, that's how they had legal access to legal property or to whatever in Jesus' times. So as he is sharing this as Matthew is writing about all of this and all the people from Abraham and how the Christ came, he very cleverly slipped in a few names. And that became very exciting. So if you just read the Bible as, it, as we just did, you won't think too much about it. He slipped in a few names. Now, you must understand, listen carefully, that the Jewish genealogy, normally when they talk about their forefathers, they always talk on the father's side. It is the seed of the man that counts. Women do not have seed. They have eggs. Am I correct biologically? Correct. Some of you are shaking your heads. All right? But so when they talk about the man, they will always talk about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and beget Judah, and all the men. But what is Matthew trying to do when he begins to slowly slip in some women? And the women he slips in, who are part of the genealogy and the family tree of Jesus Christ, have a story to tell. The first woman he slips in, her story is found in Genesis chapter 38. Judah was a great man, a patriarch, and his son, he wanted his son to have a wife, and he went to the Canaanite people. Now, Canaanite tribes were outcasts. They were not Jews. They were not part of the Jewish race. They were like outcasts, pagan, heathen. 
he gets a girl there to marry his wife, Ur. His son's name was Ur, his oldest boy. Ur was an evil person. The Bible, you can read that in Genesis 38 when you go home or while you're having tea. It, it tells us that Ur was an evil person and he did so much of wickedness that God killed him. So probably died of a heart attack, I don't know. So now he's married to Tamar, this girl who is a Canaanite. And Judah is now left with a daughter-in-law. And in their practice, the youngest son, if he grows up, he must marry her. But his youngest son is still young, so he doesn't know what to do with his daughter-in-law. He tells her, go home. Don't worry. When my youngest son grows up, I'll make sure that he marries you. He forgets about her completely. Now, you've got to understand that in the olden times, women had only three choices. Thank God for Christianity. Can you say amen? Today, women are exalted. Today, women are recognized. And the only religion, religion and I sound biased, that recognizes and honors women and treats them as equal or should be treating them equal with honor and dignity is Christianity. Jesus came and raised the standard. So if you say you're a Christian and you've, you've, got, you've got a chauvinist attitude or you're a bigot or a racist, something's wrong with your salvation. But Jesus came and called women, woman. He honored them like his mother and he raised them up. Okay? Now, in the Old Testament, when a, when a woman lost her husband, they had only three choices. One, she would starve to death. She would try to do whatever she can and she will eventually die get old, fast, and die. Two, she could be a beggar. And three, she could be a prostitute. All right? So Tamar is now sent back to her father's house, no husband, alone. And her father-in-law now has taken her out of her culture. She is now in her father's house. What is she to do? One day, she, she's waiting. She realized that the son of uh, Judah has already grown up. Shelah, his name is, the younger boy. And he doesn't come and marry this girl. So she says, what am I going to do? So she goes out. Listen carefully. She knows she hears one day Judah is coming in a certain way. She dresses up as a prostitute. She sits by the roadside. It is dark. She's covered herself with a veil. Our friend comes along and he asked her, can I sleep with you? And he doesn't know that's his daughter-in-law. And she said, all right, you can. But what are you going to pay me? He said, I'll give you a young goat. She says, fine. Where's the young goat? He said, I'll send it to you. She says, well, give me something as a surety before I get that young goat. What do you have? He said, I've got my ring. I've got this cord, not like a chain, and I've got this staff. This signets, signifies who I am. She says, all right, give it to me. And he goes into her. Months go by. One day he hears from his friend, hey, your daughter-in-law is pregnant. Oh, he gets all self-righteous. He's burning with anger. What kind of a girl is she? Bring her here. And you'll find this the story, and I want her to be burnt in front of me. Normally, when somebody does something wrong, the Jewish culture, they would stone them to death. To burn someone, it means it's a horrible, very bad person. And in his self-righteousness, he says to his friend, bring her here. So she's brought, and she says, well, I am pregnant, but can I tell you who the man who made me pregnant? And she says, well, I can only say that these things belong to him. And Judah comes out and realizes that it's him. And so he doesn't burn her, and he takes care of the child. I want you to know that's the story and one of the persons in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Will you write something about your grandfather like that? Huh? So why did Matthew... Matthew, I mean, there's so many great women in the Bible. Why didn't you write Sarah? Or Esther, why did you slip in Tamar? He's trying to give you an idea. It's for these people Jesus came. You'll go to heaven and you'll see some people you thought shouldn't be there, but they're going to be there. In fact, you should be happy you made it there. <laughs> I thought this fellow will be burning in hell. What's he doing here? All right, let's go on. Story gets worse. She gives birth to twins. She gives birth to twins. One of the boy comes out. The first fellow comes out. They tie a scarlet, a red string on his hand. And from then on, the scarlet ribbon or the scarlet thread goes on right until the coming of Jesus. 
where he is hung on a cross. The Roman soldiers put a scarlet robe on him. It was all talking about the lineage, the coming of the Messiah. As we celebrate Christmas, I just want you to get to know Jesus' family a little bit. So that you won't look down on other people over your tall nose. Some of us will have to get off that high horse and start loving people whom you thought have a scandal on their life. Did you hear the story about their family? Oh, get a life. You want to talk about Jesus' family? Let me tell you some more scandal. Some of you like scandals, right? Taking notes very fast. Huh? So Perez comes out. He's called Breakthrough. When I read this, I think, God, there's hope for me. Because there's not one family on this planet that are pure Indians. We like to boast of my grandfather, my great grand. We came from this Mayendi Pillay line, you know. Oh, we came from this particular line. There are no pure people on this planet. Thank God for mixtures. Because she was a Canaanite. Where is the bloodline, the true bloodline? Oh, we are pure Jews. Oh, really? It's shocking some of you. Huh? Now, I don't need to go home and look at your family trees. All right. I can imagine Matthew's friends looking at Matthew as he's writing and saying, Matthew, what are you thinking? I mean, why don't you include Rachel or Leah or Esther? What? These are pagan. You're talking about Jesus here. The Messiah of the world. Tema. Who dressed as a prostitute and slept with her own father-in-law and got pregnant. And from then, so just when you think there is no hope, there is hope for everybody. If God can take a wannabe prostitute who deceived her own father-in-law, and in fact, Judah said, you are more righteous than I am. At least you've got some integrity. He blessed her. Well, there's another woman there mentioned in Matthew. Her name is Rahab. This woman didn't dress as a prostitute. She was a prostitute. That was her occupation. She owned a house right on the border of Jericho. Right on the wall. So there's guys passing by, she'll go. She earned her money as a harlot. She was a lap, she was a lap dancer. She danced on tables. She was a pole dancer. She was in gentlemen's club. She was everything that you would think is such a scandalous woman. She is in the genealogy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor, somebody asked me the other day, I want to talk to you about something. He waited till nobody was around because there were all other pastors there. He said, this couple had come to me and asked me to do their wedding. I really am struggling with it. If my denomination finds out that I did their wedding, even secretly, I would be ostracized. I said, what's wrong? He said, well, they're both Christian." but the girl is very pregnant. I said, so? He said, but we should not, or at least quietly counsel them, rebuke them. I said, yeah, you can counsel them and rebuke them privately. But you don't shame the couple. And you don't shame the unborn child. I've done many weddings of people who, we don't encourage them to have sex before marriage, but it's happening in our world. But we teach our young people, that's not the way to do it. Wait, abstain. But when they got pregnant, we did their marriage. We saved the couple. The baby will grow up watching mommy and daddy's wedding photos and say, look, they had a grand wedding, not a secret wedding under a candle, under a table, somewhere hiding. Do you accept so and so? To, do you have a good, very good, shh, no cameras. Type. Okay, switch off the light, the couple's coming out. You, what kind of Christianity, I ask this pastor, one question. Let me ask you one question. If a pregnant girl and a man came and said, please, we don't want to, the child to grow up as, with a single mother, would you please do our wedding? This is the question I ask that pastor. What would Jesus do? Oh, blasphemous. 
immoral fornicators. You should be stoned. Or would he bless the couple and say, go and make a great life. Go and make a great life. Give the child all the love a mom can give. Give the child all the love a dad. Love each other. Be faithful to each other. And be blessed. And so I've done weddings for people publicly. I've done weddings for people who came children already born. Who had to be the bride. Who had to be the flower girl. They had never been married legally. So the kids are now pastor. Can we have a full-blown church wedding? You've got it. I'll be there. I'll be so proud to do your wedding. I'll be so honored. Now, please, young ladies, I'm not saying that you can go and fornicate. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm just saying that if Jesus can identify with people like Rahab, then there's hope for me. So I've entitled this message, There's Hope for Me. Because while you look at this pastor and think that he might be a very clear, good, wonderful, righteous man, only God knows my heart. As I was saying to the pastor, a lot of other people who are doing it, it's just that they didn't get pregnant, but you didn't know about it, and you still did their weddings. It's just that this one got caught. And is coming to you for help. Can somebody help me with this preaching? This is not easy to preach a message like this. Because how can pastor preach about sex and prostitutes? They're in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. It's in, it's in your Bible. What can I do? It's in the Bible. I know some people, I guarantee you, most churches will not go to that chapter. They'll just look at it and God begets so and 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 so. And the angel sang on that Christmas day. <laughs> and the shepherds were there. And little baby Jesus, oh, how sweet. But Matthew writes this, and Matthew saying, Man, I'm going to slip this in. But Matthew, don't. Well, the Holy Spirit is moving me to do it because this is going to be an eternal message every time Christmas is preached that Jesus is for you and he came to give people like you and I hope. Thank you for helping me. It's not easy. You try preaching this in Thailand and see. You try preaching this in some of these churches. Assembly of God churches. Man, you get the... The board members will walk out, tell the pastor, never bring this person here again. All our young people will get pregnant. All of them will say it's a virgin birth. Don't preach such thing. You're opening. How could he mention prostitution? Old Testament, there were prostitutes. New Testament, there were prostitutes. Stop pretending... You don't read all this. Mary Magdalene was a full-blown demon-possessed prostitute. And Jesus, she became one of Jesus' most loved disciples. All those kind of women came and anointed Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair. One woman came and did that, and they said, there she goes. She's doing it again. She's turning on a trick on this young, handsome rabbi. That's what she did to all the guys. And Jesus would say to her, your sins are forgiven, woman. Go. Go live your life. Very hard for churches to accept this message, I tell you. This is the good news before the good news. Before the coming of Jesus, there were all these salvations going on. God turning twisted life that sat on the walls of Jericho and prostituted herself. One day when the spies came to take over Jericho, they came to spy the land. Joshua had sent them and these guys came and something in her said, I, I really want this God of the Hebrews. She, you see, as I said, people tell stories. They didn't have books, so they must have heard these stories of how God wiped out the Egyptians, the mighty army of Pharaoh, covered them, buried them in the Red Sea, brought down all kinds of plagues and judgment on the land of Egypt. Now this bunch of slaves coming out. And the first town to take, the first city is Jericho. And she said, I know you guys were coming. God is with you. You know, your God is an awesome God. She's trying to preach the gospel. Read your Bible. Your God, I've heard about your God, she said. And th these guys were, were coming to get them and she hid them in her house. Rahab, the prostitute, 
hid this voice in a house. And after days went by, she let them go. And these guys promised her, when we come to take over this city, we remember what you have done. He said, I want you to tie a scarlet cloth out of your window so that when we wipe this city, we will see that scarlet, hallelujah, there's an anointing just in that woman. When I see that scarlet cloth, you will be spared and everyone in your house. It reminds me of how when the death angel came past in Egypt, remember that? When that death angel came, Moses said, put blood on the doorpost. Every house that has a blood, that angel will pass over. When I see the blood, you, friends, today we have the blood of Jesus. We took communion today. Oh my God, I hope you know what you just did. You are saying to every demon in hell, hey, there is, I'm a blood-bought person. The blood of Jesus covers me when I go to work, when I come home. My house is covered. You want to put a curse on me? Wake up. You're fighting a God that has, uh, that has put a scarlet cord on all of us. Do you understand the power? That's why the old Pentecostals will sing, there is power in the blood of Jesus. My God, there is power in the blood. You don't have to carry a talisman. You don't have to carry a cross. You don't have to be frightened. If I go to Thailand, the Buddhists, what charms they'll do against me. You don't have to fear all these things that normal people normally fear, and it's normal for them to fear. You don't have the spirit of fear. You've got no right. In fact, one of the people who will be in hell, uh, the Bible tells us in the book, of revelation are the fearful so never be fearful don't talk fear language talk faith language my god will deliver me my god will raise me up my god will restore my family my god will heal my dad my god will save my mother my god will save my father god will restore everything that the enemy has taken from me god will give it back speak that language of faith not fear you don't want to hear your fearful stories but it's reality what pastor yes Reality versus truth. Truth always wins. And Jesus said, I am the truth. So don't come talk all your fear and bring all that. You have the blood cord running in you. And so they came when they took over Jericho. Rahab was spared and she got married and she became the great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I love this. I'm enjoying this preaching so much. You're not. No woman would ever grow up saying, you know, when I grow up, I want to be a prostitute. <laughs> Life happens. No woman or man ever says, when I grow up, after I get married for a few years, I want a divorce. I want to end up a divorced person. It happens. But despite that, there is hope. Yes. Because you're connected to the giver of hope, Jesus Christ. That's what Christmas is all about. Yes. I love the turkeys. I love the... I love, I decorate my house in November for Christmas. You talk about parting, man alive, I don't have, some people decorate the Christmas tree on Christmas Eve. Some even are more dead, they decorate it on Christmas Day. You must be a dead person. You have no life, no excitement, you are a bore. Put it up, especially if you've got young children. I don't have young children anymore, but I've got grandchildren. My, their grandpa's house is decked before even their house is decked. But above all these celebrations is our appreciation that we worship a God who gives us hope, who loves us so much, who identifies and says, mm, Matthew, put them on my family tree. No, you, you don't want to do that. Tamar! Rehab. Yeah, yeah. Include them on my family. They're my family. I came from them. Yeah. Powerful, powerful, powerful. Oh, grace of grace. Well, it goes on. Worse. In Matthew 1 verse 5, it talks about a woman called Ruth. Naomi was a Hebrew woman, but there was a bad, there was a terrible famine. For many years in the land of Israel, so she left that place with her husband and her two sons. And they went to a place called Moab. Everybody say Moab. Moab. Her husband dies. Her two sons dies. How soy is that? 
Huh? Already bad luck already in the house. She sold the land, took the money, thought she can earn a living there with her. Son died, husband died, both sons died. She's got two. She's got two daughter-in-laws. One of the daughter's name was Orpa, not Oprah. I think she spelt her name wrongly, Oprah. But really, <laughs> her name was Orpa, O-R-P-A-H. P-H-A-H, Orpa. But, okay, Oprah has got her, this one. The other girl's name was Ruth. Both of them were pagans, idol-worshipping Moabites. Now, one day Naomi decides to go back to Bethlehem. And she told her daughters, why don't you go, girls stay here? You are young, you are beautiful. Find some Moabite husbands and marry them. Now, you've got to understand who the Moabites are. They are hated by the Jews. The Moabites are from a generation from Lot. Listen carefully. Lot ran away from Sodom and Gomorrah with his two daughters because her two, the two daughters' sons were gay and died there. They were very happy. So he's running with his two daughters into the wilderness. They realize we have no husband. We must keep the family lying. So let us make our father drunk and we'll sleep with him. This is in your Bible. How many of you know that the, it's scary to read the Bible? Frightening because you hear real stories like this. How many of you have had some scandal in your family? Don't put your hand up. <laughs> Two daughters sleep with their own father. They both become pregnant. One of the sons is Moab. Now the Moabites, because of that incest and because of that sin, are cursed in Israel. In Deuteronomy 23, verse 3, it says that no Moabite shall enter ever into the temple of God to the tenth generation. Deuteronomy 23, verse 3. You can write it down if you want. You can read it. Now, Ruth is a Moabite. And her mother, Naomi, says, Orpah and Ruth, stay in Moab. I'm going back to my family in shame. Don't call me Naomi, which means joy. Call me Mara, means sadness. I'm disgraced. Just let me go, girls. You've got hope here. When I go back there, I'll be disgraced and shamed. I lost everything. Cursed. And these are the powerful words of this Moabite girl called Ruth. You can find it in your Bible. In Ruth chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, till today people use it. These immortal words are used in commitment and committing ourselves to each other as a church. And many times people use it in marriages. Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For, for wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. Your God shall be my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me and more, if anything but death parts you and me. Such a great commitment. Wish we had some kind of commitment like that with each other in the church. So she goes and she marries this guy called Obed. No, sorry, Boaz. And he is a relative of Naomi. And the land is restored all the property that they lost, he becomes the kinsman redeemer. That's part of Jesus' family. No pure Jew blood there. Moabite blood. Bad people. Jesus' great, 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 great grandmother. Well, another one comes along. His name is David. Now, Matthew, please, for heaven's sake, if you want to write about David, write about David, the giant killer. David, the beloved of the Lord. Yeah? We all know that. David, the writer of Psalms. David, the great king, the worshiper, the hero. 
Why you must write about David and his affair with Uriah's wife and put that in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. It tells us very clearly that David had an affair with Uriah, who is his best buddy, that Uriah's wife. And her name is not even written, but her name is Bathsheba. And out of Bathsheba came Solomon and the lineage of Jesus Christ. When it, Solomon was born, it says he was loved of the Lord. That's what Solomon means, loved of the Lord. With such backgrounds, we find that God is saying again and again to you and I, these are the type of people Jesus lets into his kingdom. And as we come close to Christmas, you know, we're having that Christmas Hollywood thing. I want you to stretch your faith. I don't want you to think about your little cupcake and your little Christmas dinner. I want you to think of people who should be probably saved during this next couple of weeks, moving up towards, sacrifice your 200 bucks, buy it for somebody. Now, my wife and I are ordinary pastors like anybody else. We don't get a big fat salary. We're thankful to God we even got a salary. But we, we take out our Christmas share of what we thought of buying gifts for people and we are saying this is going to be our gift. This is going to be our commitment. We're not, just, we're not going to ask other people to commit and we won't commit. Above every commitment, we commit whatever we can. And so we bought a table. Cost us 2,000 bucks. Okay, done. Don't even think about it. Who knows, one person might come to Christ. That would make my Christmas. My Christmas will not be if my daughter went and bought for me another shirt. Firstly, they all don't know my size. Secondly, they don't know my taste. Or maybe my taste is very simple. Black, white, black, white. Very easy. Go into my cupboard. Black, white, black, white, black, white. That's... But I don't like them to buy stuff for me. I really don't. I can buy stuff for myself, but I got so many stuff. I give it away because people keep giving me gifts. I'm giving it away all the time. What would make my Christmas? Another fat turkey on the table? We probably this time we'll have to have two turkeys because my first grandson alone can eat one turkey. <laughs> Ethan is a big, hungry, young, strong, strapping young man. Ten years old, he can eat nonstop, that boy. So I said to my wife, this year, make sure it's two turkeys. And then, you know, would that make my day? My best gift would be somebody coming to Jesus Christ. Or at least the seed of God is planted. I got the opportunity to invite some non-Christian. cost me 200 bucks. It's nothing to bring somebody to Christ. The type of people Jesus lets into his kingdom are not at all like what you would think. So here's a poem. Can I read this poem? This is a poem. I was shocked, bewildered, and confused as I entered heaven's doors. Not by the beauty of it all, nor the lights, nor the decor. It was the folks in heaven that made me sputter and gasp. The thieves, the liars, the sinners, the alcoholics, and the trash. There stood a kid from seventh grade who stole my lunch money twice. Next to him was that old neighbor who never said anything nice. Bob, what I always thought would be rotting in hell there, but he was sitting looking pretty on cloud nine doing so well. I nudged Jesus and say, hey, what's the deal? I would love to hear your take. How did all these sinners get up here? Why, God must have made a mistake. And why is everybody so quiet and so, so somber? Give me a clue. Hush, child, Jesus said. They're all in shock because nobody thought they'll be seeing you. If you're tempted to say, but pastor, my family is too messed up, read Matthew again. And you'll find out that Jesus is really a friend of sinners. And that love, that blood that flowed from the cross, that red, red scarlet still flows today for every one of us. I remember reading this story by Tony Campolo. I think his book is called, It's Friday. Thank God it's Friday, but Sunday is coming. Something like that. A little book. And this preacher said one day he arrived in Honolulu. 
and three o'clock in the, in the in the morning he was hungry so he went down to a local cafe three o'clock in the morning thinking nobody was around just wanted to eat a nice sandwich and then try to go back and sleep he said just about that the door flung open and a group of prostitutes walk in loudly smoking they were high and they were talking and chatting and all of them were saying this and what and then he overheard one of them say hey you know what tomorrow's my birthday one of the girls said and they all all the girls like just laughed yeah 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 when do we all remember our birthday and after they had been talking they all walked out of the door and tony campolo sitting there talked to the owner, Harry, his name was. He said, hey, Harry, did you hear that that girl said, uh, her name is Cindy. Did you hear that she said that it's a birthday tomorrow? So yeah, I heard that. Yep, Cindy comes here. She's one of the local prostitutes. He said, how about we throw a party for Cindy and have a birthday for her? How about if she came, would she come again? To, he said, yeah, she'll be here tomorrow. How about if we, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll bake. He said, no. He said, that's a great, he called his wife, hey. Calls his wife over and said, this guy here wants to throw a birthday for Cindy tomorrow. And she said, okay, we'll do the cake. We'll bake the cake. We'll make it nice and beautiful. He said, okay, I'll bring the decorations. I'll decorate it. You'll help us. We'll throw a party. So he came earlier and he did up the place and they baked the cake and all of that. And about three o'clock in the morning, this group of prostitutes come in and Cindy walks in with them. And these guys had all planned and they all jumped out of behind the bar and said, happy birthday, Cindy. And everybody cheered for her and she just was in shock. She was just in shock and couldn't say anything. And they brought out this cake for her and they put it there. They said, Come on, Cindy, blow out the candle. Let's cut the cake and eat. And she just stared at the cake for a while and then she responded, is it okay if I just took home the cake? I just want to show my mother who lives just nearby. Is it okay if I took the cake home? They said, yeah, it's your cake, you can do whatever. She said, I'll come back in a little while. I'll just go home, put it there, and I'll come back in a little while. They said, okay, and they all kept talking. And so she walked out. And Tony Compolo, at that point, when everybody saw that, sh that she was so shaken, they were all beginning to get quiet. And Tony Compolo says, uh, can I pray for her? And pray for all of you. And they didn't know how to respond. How do you respond when somebody says, can I pray for you? And so he prayed for everybody and blessed them in Jesus' name and blessed the girl. And then they all left. The owner of the cafe said to him, hey, you didn't tell me you were a preacher. What church do you belong to? And this is what the Holy Spirit told Tony Campolo to say. He said, I belong to the church that throws parties for prostitutes at 3 o'clock in the morning. And Tony Campolo and, and the guy Harry said, nah, there's no such church like that. If there was such a church, I'd join it. I wonder what people think about our church. I wonder what this Christmas would look like as we go into a new year. I wonder how many people will come to know Jesus just because we were willing to realize that there's hope for everybody. There's hope for the worst, worst scandalous person, no matter how bad things might be. But there's hope for them. Amen? Let's stand together. Let's close. I've taken up a lot of time already. So, can I just encourage you to keep talking, inviting your friends, get a ticket, get a table, invite people to come for the Christmas uh, thing that we're going to have. Ah, it's going to be fun and dance and all of that. People be eating and drinking and we'll be celebrating, you know, uh, on that uh, Christmas Hollywood thing. But I will be speaking the gospel. Two Fridays from now, two, two Fridays from now, isn't it? Two Fridays from now. On Saturday, on Saturday, this is the 20th, we're going to be having a combined Christmas worship. And believe it or not, the state government is paying for us. It's cost them thousands of dollars. And I'll be preaching the gospel. They'll have carols, Methodist church, Anglican church. Everybody will be singing. And I'll get a time to preach the gospel. Our Mantri Basa will be there. All the politicians will be there. And it's going to be held outside GM, the car park. They're going to book the whole place, expecting thousands of people to be there. They're giving away free food. What an opportunity to declare Jesus Christ in 2015. I thank the Lord. I really do. Thank God.
for this freedom and opportunity that we have. While there is time, use this freedom. While there is time. Don't grumble and complain. Uh, what could be, it could happen, that could happen. Stop it. And start getting more aggressive with your faith in wanting to see people come to know Jesus. If, if, look at me. If you say you can identify with the Jesus that Matthew wrote about, what would your heart be like? What would your heart be like? You look at scandalous people and say, you know how much God loves you. You are just the kind of people God wants you in His house. You're just the kind of people we want you in our church. Hey, you're welcome in our church. We'll throw a party for you. We'll buy you a dinner ticket. We'll take you out for breakfast. We'll meet you for lunch. We'll, we'll pay for dinner. You're going to be my friend. I love you. Because that's the kind of church I belong to. A Jesus kind of a church. We're not a political arm. Yeah, that's why you're very seldom hearing me get politicians to come up or speak about PKR or, or Barisan. Hey, we are not a political party. We are not a political arm. We are a church of Jesus Christ. So I'm not ashamed that I don't dress up in yellow or red or blue or white to walk on the streets. I, you didn't go, a Pastor. No, I didn't. I'm too lazy to go. I don't really care because I know that God answers our country's problem by the power of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name, not by, you know, whatever we might try to do. I'm not against that. I'm for it. I thank God for people who do that. I thank God for the guts. I don't. Because I don't want people to ever associate me with a political party, with a political agenda. If people see Joseph Ramaya, they know he doesn't have a political aim to gain anything. But I have one agenda, to glorify Jesus Christ. To introduce men, failing men, suffering men and women to Jesus Christ. That's my call and I have no apology for that. I want you on the inside with a heart that's burning this Christmas. To get behind the vision of our church. Get behind the programs of our church. Look out for the lost and bring them to Christ. In Jesus' name. Amen. Do you receive the word this morning? Yes. I really, I really appreciate you sucking it in. I can see that in your faces. You're drawing it in, man. Jesus, this is our Lord. This is His family tree. We are invited into His family. How great is our God. Let's sing and worship the Lord together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Shatakama. Satatama. Grace, 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 grace. Grace, glorious grace, grace, glorious grace, at the cross you call it finished, grace, wonderful grace, grace, wonderful grace, at the cross all of my sin.
Father, thank you for the gift of Christmas, for families that we can celebrate with. God, give us the heart of Christ, the Christ of Christmas, the heart that says, everyone should be in my family. Give us that heart that says, I stretch my hand out to people who are far away and think it's hopeless. Give us a heart that says, before this Christmas is over, I want to embrace someone, bring them close to Christ. Lord, give us the desire of our heart this Christmas to see men and women celebrating Jesus even though they don't know Him. Holy Spirit, help us, we pray. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. I hope you go home and <coughs> start working on those cakes and get the Christmas shopping going. But I want you to really, really focus on this one thing. Men and women should be coming to Christ. Every gift I buy, every time I look at a present, I say the greatest present was hung on a tree. The first Christmas tree was the cross. That's the gift that God has given to us. The first Christmas tree, the first Christmas gift was a bloody man bleeding and dying on the cross covered with scarlet blood and included all of us that's why we have a merry christmas amen, amen. so what you have a blessed christmas if you haven't got the tickets yet for the dinner i want to encourage you 200 bucks nothing do it buy it for somebody tell somebody to go encourage them Jesus name but more than that when we have our Christmas service this year we will have it on the 25th as well make sure you bring somebody we'll have one service here one service in care we'll do this one earlier that one a bit later so I can rush over and preach over there but make sure people come in Jesus name amen hug somebody punch them in the arm wrestle them on the floor Tell them how much you are crazy about them. Love them. Love each other in Jesus' name. Come on. Greet one another and love each other in Jesus' name.